Thank you so very much uh, for all those in the room and all those online and all those who'll be watching in the streaming captured piece. Uh, it's a real honor to be here, a true, true honor. Um, you know, it's a little hard to follow what I just followed. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a little wrapped up in where I just was, and I'm still there, actually. So, uh, you know, and actually it's a, it's a beautiful segue, um, because what we're talking about here, and so just to give you guys a little bit of a different perspective, I used to be a science teacher. I loved being a science teacher. Seeing what I just saw makes me want to be a science teacher again, hopefully soon. Um, but, you know, obviously I need to be where I am. And the reason why I am where I am is because I represent the, the climate and global change research community focused on education. And the reason why we're focused on education is because the, the, just doing the science, the observations, the research, the modeling, the decision support tools to work with decision makers is not enough. Because the capacity to actually do what we have is actually what we just saw. And waking up that capacity is something that is critical to what we have to do uh, to address the issues that Dr. Holdren laid out for us. Uh, and that's where we are. And that's, that's why the, the power of the education system is bringing brought to bear. Those investments are critical to the path choice that we have before us. So, you know, we've been, it's interesting. If you look at the history of this, we've actually known this for quite some time between this report, NOAA was, was requested by Congress to fund in 2009, we, and they, they started coming out, uh, and America's Climate Choices, again, choices. And it laid out a pathway, and education was part of that pathway. And so you look at it, and, and it's like, you know, perhaps the most powerful tool, actually. It's not just more observations, more models, more decisions, you know, more information briefings, more, more, more. No, actually, it's the capacity to drill with all the already that is actually critical to what we have before us. And so, you know, making these informed decisions that we as citizens and future workforce have is absolutely critical. But, you know, uh, there's some issues. So, you know, how many of you in the room know, have seen this report? How many of you have not seen this report? Okay. This is your report. This is the National Climate Assessment. We spend a lot of time generating this to inform you, everyone, all decision makers, including all citizens, all generations, and it's written with a great deal of care to inform you on exactly what we were talking about at the beginning of this. So we have a lot of, of inputs, but, you know, as Dr. Holdren said, we have choices, and the inflection between a low-carbon global economy and a high carbon economy, we have an observatory at NOAA sitting on top of a mountain in, in, uh, in Hawaii that's watching. And so we're going to be the arbiter, and maybe, maybe that's a little bit of a stronger word than I meant, but we're going to be watching to see whether or not which future we're collectively choosing. And we do this with brilliant precision. In that little room right there, if you ever get a chance to go into that little room where, where uh, Ralph, uh, Dr. Keeling figured out how to measure with incredible precision so that the measurements were never in question. And so we know. We know what's happening, and we see it. And we see it again, and we just saw it again. We're going to keep on seeing it for decades, and we've seen it for many decades before. But that's, for me, this is a really important piece of the story because it's, you know, choices are important, but whether or not the choices actually have the outcome you want, and, uh, and you're continuing to refine it. So. You know, the reason I chose this image is, you know, I'm almost 50. Um, and, you know, this is what I would have looked like in some of the, the case studies that Plum Landing would have been focused on, right? In 1972-ish. This is not actually me. I'm not in this picture. Uh, but this is the kind of school I went to in downtown Philadelphia. And if you think about it, you know, are we ready to solve the climate change, you know, change and prepare for the impacts? Not yet. We didn't make the investments that we just saw in the, the school in Connecticut back in 1970. So the citizens that are now in our cohort really have not put the time in to be ready. Investments in education come well ahead of when you need them, decades ahead of when you need them. So we have got to get the investments right now because we're going to need them from now for at least a century, if not more. 
These investments are absolutely critical to making the difference that we are talking about, making the changes together. And I'm not just talking about in the United States. So, you know, uh, but the real thing is about how. So this is a, you know, I think another piece of what was, Mike was talking about is relevance. It absolutely comes through. If you are going to talk with students about what they're going to learn and you don't tap into the relevance of why do I and what I'm interested, why is my time in, in spent here wisely? I mean, I, I'm a consumer with my feet just like anybody else. Students are as well. You got to draw them in. And the rel if you don't make it relevant to their world, it, you know, they're not going to put the time in. So why is climate relevant is perhaps the most relevant thing there is. And yet they don't see it, they don't know it, and that's our job as educators in the education systems, formal, informal, place-based, doesn't matter, it's all important. Here, you know, when you do put the time in to make it relevant, we've seen examples already today, we're gonna see more examples later today, uh, and I think that that's gonna be a really important piece. But, you know, if we've looked at this, in 2011, some of the analysis was is that kids, they don't feel really informed. They totally hear this subject, right? But they want more time. They want more time. On this topic, education systems are being pushed by their students to put more time on this. And we already saw with Brian's talk, time and coherence matter greatly. And on this subject, we historically have not put the time in and the students are now asking for that time. It's up to us to actually fulfill that request. You know, that's, that's on us. So, you know, part of uh, what, what Dr. Holdren was talking about is, you know, a group of agencies, some of us in the room, some of us online, were contributing to this, the White House Climate Education Literacy Initiative. And part of that was, was listening to students. And so, you know, these group of young leaders who were in different organizations and partnerships uh, around the nation came and they sent their students into the White House and they met with, you know, Administrator McCarthy and actually John Holdren was in this room, he just wasn't in the picture and they had a lot of things they say. They had some very specific things they had to say. And some of the things that they had to say is, is definitely what I've already said, but it's better said from them. Now, I, I don't have an audio of this. I, it would have probably been a good idea to capture it in video that day. We have some other things, but you know, so um, one of the things they said is they want an opportunity to lead. They want an opportunity to lead. We got to hear it and we got to listen to it. And then we actually have to give them the tools and resources and invest in them in order to do exactly what we've already seen and we'll continue to see today. Um, they wanted to connect it to what is important to them, to local issues, to global issues. I, I really love the fact that the Nepal to, uh, example is, is meant so much to students who, uh, you know, saw that in another part of the world. That's a really important thing we're going to be working on for quite some time. You know, they want integration across the curriculum. They don't want, this is not just a STEM subject. This is an all education subject. You know, everything that you bring to bear in your learning in all forms of education, they absolutely see it, and so do a lot of educators. Um, you know, so they, uh, they want technology. They want to leverage that technology. A lot of teachers still have, you know, students kind of hide your technology, put it in the bucket, put it off to the side. They want to bring every tool that they are very skilled at using on these issues, and they want that, you know, heard and, and listened to. They're quite clear, by the way. It's quite lovely. Um, and, you know, they, they want opportunities. They want us to give them opportunities so that they can actually further, so internships, fellowships, you know, give them the opportunities to really accelerate what they know and can bring to bear. And that's, that's, uh, that's critically important. Now, it's up to us to actually listen. And, then, and we're going to have some other students who are actually going to make further requests of us as education systems. And remember, this is not just the people in the room, it's not just the people who are watching the streaming, it's the people who are gonna watch this in an archive fashion. And, you know, I'm gonna help raise what they're saying, that's part of my job. So, you know, back in 2008, seven, six, actually, we started thinking that education was really important. We saw all the documents, and then we said, well, what exactly is it? And so a, a large consortium of us came together and defined what climate literacy was. And it was codified in this document. And this thing has gone through extensive review, uh, climate review, <laughs> agency review, community review. And what came out of it is, is changing the field that we're looking at in really important ways. And a lot of leaders are 
here in the room. Uh, this is, as you said, you know, this is, this is all those people were involved, hundreds and hundreds of people involved in figuring out what this is. But, you know, one of the things that, that we found was this idea that, you know, <laughs> citizens need to understand climate and have the knowledge and, and be engaged in it as members of their communities, right? This is, this is the kind of guiding concept. So if we're going to do that, how, what's it take to make that happen? Well, don't try and read this. It's only an illustration. The new framework and the resulting standards, whether you're in an NGSS adopting, adapting, inspired by state, it really kind of doesn't matter at some level. What matters is contact time on important issues in a coherent way with relevance. And until we had this framework and the resulting in, in, uh, ways that education systems were using that, a lot of this contact and time and coherence didn't exist. And so if you want to actually spend the time to build what we're talking about, you got to put the time on it. And if you're, you're putting on time on something else, well, now we're calling less topics, more relevant topics, and more time on those topics, coherently across time, kindergarten, 12th grade, and beyond. Right? This is, doesn't stop at 12th grade, by the way. We all know that, but it's just worth saying. But if you look at this, the richness of learning space is so amazing. Again, I wish I was back in the classroom. I'd love to teach in this space because it's such a wonderful, rich uh, opportunity. And the red is a really important one, is the engineering designs part of the framework and the standards. And when you look at the application for evaluating, developing possible solutions, developing possible solutions, one, you have to do it cross-curricular. You can't only do that in the science classroom. And also, that's, that's really a new space for us. And again, as Brian said, that we're lifting up excellent work across the nation and trying to understand how the field and all these pockets of excellent in innovation could lift up together in a more intentional way. Well, that's, there are places out there that are doing this. We're seeing them. But I think raising it up as a, an example and transferring it across the nation so that students, not just in Hartford, but in Chicago or in Louisville, Kentucky, can also get into that, that space that is highly relevant and meaningful and also where most of the jobs, not most, an extensive amount of jobs across the world are going to be. This, the revolution of transition to a low carbon economy is a huge jobs program. The question is, are we ready for those jobs? But so these standards are, are changing the education system across the nation in really amazing ways. And it's never happened with the coherence as much as it has. I've heard as numbers high, and Brian, you used the number a little lower. I've heard as high as 65% of the students and teachers are working in these new standards in one way or another. Maybe that's a little high. Maybe it's a little low. Maybe it's, I've heard as high as 70, but I, I couldn't believe that number yet. It's a little early. And these, these reforms and changes take time. But 65, we've never come even close to something like that in the nation. The new standards in the 90s didn't achieve that. Everybody kind of still did their own thing, whether in different states and different districts, and it didn't really get the coherence across the, the system. But, you know, if it's that much, but look at this. The education systems in the nation are humongous. One in four people in the nation is a student. One in four, right? One in four. You got to remember that number because that is a monstrous fraction of the nation. And so if we're going to talk about this, ref this effort, we have to talk about it at scale. And that scale is really substantial. You've got millions of teachers, millions of informal educators, millions of students, not a few. So clearly one of the driving principles of this forum is digital because you are able to hit scale. You can't hit scale with just face-to-face. -face. Not if the speed and urgency we're talking about here is absolutely critical. And you know, time is a real point. So we're looking at this and trying to come up with how do we work this across scale in time. And that's an important thing. So this comes from the IPCC document. It's a hidden little document called The Foundations of Decision Making. And they talk about this. Now, they, uh, they, the writers of this didn't really realize that education was a critical part in the foundation of decision making. I'm going to ding them on that when I'm in Paris in a couple weeks. But if you look up there, 
the context of decision making is people and knowledge. How can you do that without education? How can you do it without education? You can't. It's impossible. So we're, we're gonna, this is the way the scientific community think about this. We're going to have to inform this and help them realize that there's much more capacity to bring to bear through our contributions, and so we will. You know, we have, we have uh, systems like this where we have students in informal education venues who are doing amazing work in informal education, understanding the earth as a system. Well, you know, they're going to bring these tools in. You have amazing programs like the Solar Decathlon. And the reason why I chose this slide is because they look excited. <laughs> they look stoked, actually. And as the president recently said about uh, women in a certain context, they're badass. Uh, you know, I mean, let's cut to the chase, right? I mean, what they've done in designing whole new ways of how homes can be, right, and winning awards and being excited and throwing every bit of talent, passion, and engineering and, and design principles at it is really quite, is, is quite uh, impressive. This isn't all bad. Actually, there's quite a lot of awesomeness in it that's a lot of fun and generative. And, you know, this is the hashtag we're going to be using in Paris. So I'm part of the U.S. delegation. We're going to be bringing this. And so the youth voice is coming through this hashtag. And why we, why we put it here for you guys is because if you want to listen to what they're saying to inform what we're talking about, you might want to dip into this, whether on Facebook or Twitter. Although my nieces, who I'm staying with in Boston, are telling me actually Twitter is not where they speak. They speak in Instagram. Um, so, you know, I mean, we're getting schooled. I was last night. Um, but the un, un, unfinished work of the solar array is, is, is an example of what we have before us. And if you want to actually teach this, we've done a lot of brilliant work uh, as a community on climate.gov to explore resources here. But it's about the motivation to use the re resources that I think is much more important at this stage. When we get to the hard, hard lifting, come here, plus other places. But you got to get motivated to do it first so that you can really operate at a systems change. And that's, that's why I'm here. And I, I got to say thank you to WGBH and the leadership you guys have done. This is a spectacular opportunity, and I, and I couldn't be more happy and proud. Thank you.